A federal judge just destroyed the government's law related to felons in possession of firearms, and it's magical. We're going to want to pay attention to this one because this will be appealed, and I still think the way that this judge decided is going to lock this down going forward. Guys and gals, first I want to thank the sponsor of the video, and that's Blackout Coffee. At Blackout Coffee, we make the best coffee in the land. If you don't believe me, just give it a try, and I'll save you money on your order, too. Check out blackoutcoffee.com slash GNG. You can always use code GNG10 to save 10% on your entire order. We do coffee. We do loose leaf teas. We do hot chocolate. We also do the whole process on our own. We buy the beans green from around the globe, from the best places that farmers grow them. We roast it ourselves. We bag it or grind it ourselves. We flavor our coffee ourselves. We make our own K-cups. We do it all in-house, guys and gals. Blackoutcoffee.com slash GNG. And there's still time to invest in Blackout if you are interested. Links will be down below. Thank you for your support and allowing us to be one of the fastest growing coffee companies in the land. And we support the Second Amendment. We donate to GOA. We donate to FPC. And we send a coffee over to our troops overseas. All right, let's jump into this lawsuit here. Here is the case on the screen, and I am going to tell you what Mr. Bullock did that got to where we are today. First off, here's the factual uh, procedural history for this. In 1992, 31-year-old Jesse Bullock got into a deadly bar fight in Jackson, Mississippi, where he was later convicted of aggravated assault and manslaughter. As a result of those felonies, Bullock served 15 to 16 years in state prison and lost several civil rights. Bullock also permanently lost his right to possess firearms and ammunition. At the time, the Second Amendment provided him no safe harbor and no protection. If Mr. Bullock was ever found with firearms or ammunition, he could be charged with a new crime, which is felon in possession of a firearm, and if convicted, sent back to prison. Well, obviously, something happened where he has appealed this before the court. Let's get into it. The government alleges that Mr. Bullock violated 922 G1 by knowingly possessing a firearm on May 3rd of 2018 when he was about 57 years old. All right, that's 2018, and I want you to pay attention closely to the timeline I'm about to establish in this case. And think about what if this was you and it took, and the government did what it did to this cat. Check it out. The grand jury returned its first indictment in August of 2018. It charged Bullock with knowingly possessing a firearm and demanded forfeiture of his firearms and ammunition and sought a mandatory minimum 15 years in prison. Okay, August of 2018. The government did not arrest Mr. Bullock at the time. It's not clear that Mr. Bullock even knew about the pending charge. 14 months passed with no activity. That means over a year went by, he wasn't arrested, he didn't go to jail, Hmm. In October of 2019, the grand jury returned a superseding indictment. This charging document amended the sentencing re request to no more than 10 years in federal prison, and again, more time passed. Bullock was finally arraigned in March of 2020, around the start of the pandemic. The magistrate judge held a detention hearing the next month, so now we're in April of 2020. After listening to the testimony, Judge Ball thought it downright silly to claim that Bullock poses a danger to his wife contrary to her sworn testimony, contrary to the time that he's been out on bond from this very incident, several years, and no one feeling that he poses such a danger that they need to go pick him up as early as August of 2018 when he was first indicted. Judge Ball released Mr. Bullock on an unsecured bond, and Bullock has remained on bond ever since without incident. Okay, years have passed, with the courts just playing games with this guy's freedom. But that's not all. A series of pandemic-related continuances followed. The continuances were unopposed. As the U.S. Attorney's Office and Federal Public Defender agreed that trials should proceed first for those defendants detained in jail. With the pandemic receding in 2022, this matter was almost ready to be tried before a jury of Mr. Bullock's peers. In August of that year, 
2022, now four years after the original indictment, he filed the present motion to dismiss. The court turns to that now. And what happened in that time frame, in that delay of the government actually doing anything to Mr. Bullock? Yeah, the Bruin decision happened. And the Bruin decision said that text history and tradition is the only test when it comes to a government law removing the right of someone's right to keep and bear arms inside and outside the home. And here we go with this judge decision, stand by, grab some popcorn. It's phenomenal. And District Judge Carlton W. Reeves of the Southern District of Mississippi said, in this case, the federal government seeks to imprison Jesse Bullock for possessing a firearm as a convicted felon. Mr. Bullock claims that this is a violation of his Second Amendment rights. He observes that he finished serving his sentence long ago, and the available evidence indicates that the firearm the government complains of was kept in the sanctity of his home. Yet, 922G1's ban on gun possession is a lifetime one. The question presented appears simple. Has the government demonstrated that, as to Mr. Bullock, the federal felon in possession ban is consistent with America's historical tradition on firearm regulation? The government says the answer is also simple, yes. It points to more than 120 U.S. District Court decisions which recently determined that the government had met its burden, at least in those cases. This court is not so sure. The government citation to the mere volume of cases is not enough. There also is doubt about the process those cases used to determine the history of the felon in possession ban. In none of those cases did the government submit an expert report from a historian justifying felon disarmament. In none of those cases did the court possess an amicus brief from a historian. And in none of those cases did the court itself appoint an independent expert to help sift through the historical record. It is unsurprising that the government relies on jurisprudence filled with such methodological flaws. The same errors define the Supreme Court's own Second Amendment jurisprudence. In Heller, Justice Scalia's opinion for the court conducted a de novo review of history using the party's briefs and amicus briefs from academics. This was surprising in light of Justice Scalia's long-held belief that, quote, sign on multiple professor amicus briefs in a case are a political rather than an academic exercise motivated by partisanship and hopes for preferment. It was further surprising, given Justice Scalia's disapproval of the court's, quote, picking and choosing those studies that support its position, end quote, while, quote, never explaining why those particular studies are methodologically sound. Justice Scalia knew firsthand the risk of cherry-picking briefs to support one's ideological priors. Yet it appears that the court continues to engage in law office history, that is, history selected to fit the needs of people looking for ammunition in their cases, in constitutional interpretation. The judge starts to slay the government right here. Nonetheless, the standard announced by the Supreme Court in Bruin is the law of the land. It must be enforced. Under that standard, the government has failed to meet its burden. The federal felon in possession ban was enacted in 1938, not 1791, or 1868, the years the Second and Fourteenth Amendment were ratified. The government's brief in this case does not identify a, quote, well-established and representative historical analog, end quote, from either era supporting the categorical disarmament of tens of millions of Americans who seek to keep firearms in their home for self-defense. American history might support state-level felon disarmament laws, that at least would align with principles of federalism. It might support disarmament of persons adjudicated to be dangerous, as Justice Barrett found when she sat on the Seventh Circuit. She dissented in that case. And it likely does support disarmament of persons convicted of death-eligible offenses. The power to take someone's life necessarily includes the lesser power to disarm them. The government's arguments for permanently disarming Mr. Bullock, however, rest upon the mirage of dicta, buttressed by a cloud of law review articles that do not support disarming him. In Bruin, the state of New York presented 700 years of history to try to defend its nearly 1900s 
era gun licensing law, and that was not enough. Bruin requires no less skepticism here, where the challenge law is even younger. For the reasons that follow, therefore, Mr. Bullock's motion to dismiss will be granted. I will have a link to this decision down below at 77 pages. This judge slays the government, and it is phenomenal. We need more judges to do this, to grab them and shake them and do the right thing, because if all federal judges did their job and ruled according to Bruin, <laughs> the anti-gunners would be gone from existence. Yet here we are still fighting. We are winning in federal courts. It does take time, and I am just like you. It frustrates me to no avail that it just can't be done lickety-split. But here we are. We continue winning. And a lot of this is because of the help that the gun groups are doing. So donate to those groups. Help those who help you. Support those who support you. And you can also support Firearms Policy Coalition and Gun Owners of America by buying their blends of coffee at blackoutcoffee.com slash GNG. Shameless plug, but we donate to those groups every single month, and uh, it's helping, believe me, it's helping. Uh, so check us out down below. Thank you for your time. Let me know what you think about this ruling related to the felon in possession law. I know the government's going to at least go to the, um, at least the three judge panel and perhaps on banc, We'll see what those two rulings provi provide, uh, but if, the f if, if this current Supreme Court gets this uh, just based off of Bruin, the 922s, all of them, are in some serious, serious trouble. Later, dudes. I'll see you all on the next one. Take care.